Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafb.com. everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who bring us all of the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Black bears are causing trouble in Virginia farm fields, but not where you might think. Chef Maxwell shows us how to make a summertime favorite, watermelon pickles. And this week we visit Pittsylvania County to learn more about this agricultural powerhouse. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're here at Maymont Park in downtown Richmond, where they actually have a black bear exhibit. Bears have been a problem for farmers in Western Virginia and orchard owners for many years. Dave Miller reports they're becoming a nuisance elsewhere in the state as well. Black bears are one of Virginia's largest wild animals. In recent years, their population has been growing, and they are now found in every part of the state except the eastern shore. With close to 18,000 bears, there's bound to be more interaction between the animals and farmers. Lately, bears have been making problems for producers in southeastern Virginia. Seems that humans are not the only creatures who enjoy a good Virginia peanut. It was pretty interesting in the way the bear did damage. Some of them would just sit down in the peanut field and kind of turn as they dug up the peanuts, and you'd see a big pile of vines in the middle of where the bear was sitting. Uh, and bears have also done random damage across the field uh, in that they just pulled the plants up as they went across the field and dropped the vines down. Of course, in the peanut digging process, all of those vines that have been removed from the row cause you a digging problem because they want to gather up on the digger and not flow through the digger properly. Farmers say bears don't just pick one vegetable or fruit at a time. They're more like a bull in a china shop, knocking down all the plants near them, then sitting down in the center and taking their time to eat. They can go through a couple of acres of peanuts or corn before a grower even knows they're there. They've even been known to tear into large cotton bales, costing the grower valuable time and money to clean up. And the quality of the raw cotton is reduced. We should be able to come out for each individual load, so to speak, and, and make one trip. Well, um, what, what the damage that we were seeing around here, it would create multiple trips to and from the field. Um, not just the number of times we'd have to come out to help clean up and get it all, get it all back to, to be processed, but also the exposure that it could, could open up for the actual crop itself. Monitoring bear populations and reducing bear damage is the role of the State Game and Inland Fisheries Department. Farmers have been reporting these damages to wildlife officials, hoping for relief. The State Department attempts to control bear populations through relocation, removal, and controlled hunting seasons. Each situation is unique, so wildlife officials work with producers to develop a strategy to discourage future bear visits. We realize that, that most people want wildlife in general, but when you get more specific, uh, there's, there are too many, and there can be too many, and there can be too few. Uh, so we try to find the right balance in there between um, these competing interests. And, and many times, understandably, uh, agricultural producers want maybe fewer. They don't want none. You know, I, I think people um, can get that mistake, mistaken impression as well. Bears can travel many miles in a single day and are usually on the move. So when wildlife officers respond to a complaint, many times the bear has moved on. Bear sightings are increasing every year, and game officials have some tips for how to stay safe around a black bear. If you have a bear around your house, uh, if you have pets out, um, put your dog food up, just feed, feed your cats, your dogs, put the food away. Um, your bird feeders, the same thing if you have one around the house, just put your bird feeders up for a week and let them move on to the next place. And a lot of times they'll just leave and not come back. Um, same thing for your trash. If you have garbage, if you've had a cookout and you have food or greasy smells in your trash can, 
um, try to empty that out or do a better job packaging it up for uh, the dump. With the state's growing bear population, there's an increasing chance of seeing a bear along the roadside or on your property. While that may be an exciting event, it can also be a nuisance, especially if the bear finds food and returns again and again. The Virginia Wildlife Conflict Helpline reported more than 2,300 black bear calls in the past 12 months, the highest of any wildlife species. Experts say the best advice for a bear encounter is just to leave the bear alone, and it will move on. In Southampton County, this is Dave Miller. Bears are just one wildlife species that cost Virginia farmers money. Protected species like black vultures and eagles often kill newborn calves and lambs, especially in southwest Virginia. The Virginia Wildlife Conflict Helpline received 456 calls for help with bird problems in 2018. Coyotes have been preying on sheep and lambs for decades in the mountains of Virginia and are now established across the state. Deer consume soybean crops in the summer and damage fruit trees each winter, in addition to being a traffic hazard. And farmers in southeastern Virginia are dealing with an influx of wild hogs that destroy crops. Hi, today we're going to be talking about cut flowers for the home garden from the ground up. Please stay tuned. Farm Bureau is the insurance provider of choice for farmers. But did you know all Virginians can benefit? In fact, most of our members are not farmers. Members may take advantage of discounts on selected autos, trucks, mowers, and tractors on top of the many insurance offerings. Your $40 membership will easily pay for itself with their many savings options as well. Farm Bureau is made for Virginians. To learn more about the membership advantage, go to VAFB.com or visit your local Farm Bureau. Did you know you could make good money raising a small crop in your own garden? Chris Mullins talks to an expert about raising cut flowers from the ground up. Well, hi and welcome. Today we're at the Fauquier Education Farm. We're here with Mr. Jim Hankins, the Executive Director. Jim, thanks for letting us come out today and talk about cut flowers. That's a beautiful bouquet you've got. Um, is this something for the home gardeners, maybe, to grow cut oh, flowers? Absolutely. You know, I really frequently call cut flowers the gateway drug to commercial agriculture. Anybody can produce, you know, a really a large abundance of cut flowers, even on a small plot of land. Um, it's really pretty simple. A little bit of research, getting, learning to know, to know some of the right best varieties to start out with and they are just extremely easy. I understand, I understand that and I think how did you get started growing cut flowers? You know my brother Andy Hankins years ago came up and saw my big half acre garden in Loudoun County and said you should look at cut flowers you could make a little bit of money on it and you know very casually that first summer I cleared about five thousand dollars off of about a half an acre of cut flowers like I've got here in this demonstration plot um, and it started my career in commercial agriculture. That's great because this is something, I mean, this is a larger plot here, but this is something gardeners can do on a small scale and it might even grow into an enterprise for them. Absolutely. You know, I just had a workshop last week and I had a wonderful couple from Bloom Flower Farm come down and speak. They are doing about this scale and just doing an honor stand at the end of their driveway okay. and selling their arrangements for ten dollars a piece and doing quite well at it. The first place for anyone to start are zinnias. They are really really simple. You know this is a cut flower that as long as you are cutting them properly and keeping them pruned back, they will keep on producing until the frost kills them. You know, the cut floral varieties of sunflowers, really, really easy to create a very dramatic effect. Um, very, very easy. Um, and then, you know, this whole host, I've got um, Dianthus and Status and Edgeratum, Celosia, a couple different kinds, and Rebecca. These are all basic, easy varieties. I see. Okay. Now, what do you do when they get long enough or when their blooms are open, you start cutting them? How would you cut the zinnias? Well, one of the things that's really important, you can see that I've got a fairly wide bed here. 
because I want good, long, straight stems. You want that for an arrangement. Okay. If you plant them in a single row, you're going to get a lot of long, curved stems. Okay. And so it's really important to always remember that you're cutting down low on the plant. This is a perfect stem. You know, and if I'm making an arrangement with it, I'll take off most of the leaves. That's a perfect stem. Oh, that's great. You know, yeah, nice, nice long stem, good, straight. straight string or stem length. You know, another great pointer again in keeping things into a thick bed. The sunflowers, you know, most of the time, you don't want the great big sunflowers. You need to plant them close together. If what you're doing is trying to cut for arrangements, right. these little smaller sunflowers are the way to go. Oh, great. And yeah. again, you know, if you plant them in a single row, you're going to end up with stems that are half an inch or an inch and a half thick. Okay. And so that won't work in a vase. Okay. So, so kind of yeah. getting them a little closer together. A little bit closer together on a lot of varieties. I notice you're growing on ground cover. Is that a good thing to do? We've talked about it with vegetables, and it's true with um, cut flowers as well. Weeding is going to be the most, or weeds are going to be the most common source of failure for folks. Okay. You know, it's so much fun to get out in May and put in a big garden and come back in August and it's an Easter egg hunt to try to find something because the weeds have overtaken. This landscape fabric will reduce that weeding by about 90%. Okay. It's reusable for many years. And and it's conserving moisture. It just works really well. Well, this is just amazing. Such a beautiful display. Thank you so much for letting us come out and see the cut flowers you're growing here today. Jim. Always a pleasure. Well, for more information about cut flower production, contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Watermelon pickles are a classic summertime treat. Chef John Maxwell shows us how to make them next in the heart of the home. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends. And then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Summertime treats can be easy and fun to make in the kitchen. Chef John Maxwell shows us how to make a Virginia classic, watermelon pickles in the heart of the home. Hi, welcome to the heart of the home. I'm Chef John Maxwell, and we're here at Meadow Hall at Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia. Every week we get a chance to play with some great Virginia food. Today's no exception. We're gonna be playing with some watermelon. Uh, we're gonna be playing with the part that's left over after you enjoy your watermelon. Uh, we're gonna pickle some watermelon rind. Uh, it's a great pickle. It's a good way to use up the rest of the watermelon. Do not let your kids eat the watermelon first. Trim the, the watermelon out of the, the rind. And these are over here for me to snack on as we, we go through this. So I've, I've got some watermelon rind that I cut and I've, I've brined them. I've got them in a, um, soaked them in salt water for a, a, a few hours and then soaked them overnight in a vinegar solution to get them textured and to absorb some of the salt and the, the vinegar. Now I'm going to rinse these off in the sink behind me, so pardon my back. And make sure that I use cold water to do this rinse because I don't want to um, allow the cucumber to absorb any more, or the uh, watermelon rind to absorb any more salt than I have to. Right. Okay, so I'll rinse them all off. Now they're still going to have some salt flavor to them because they've been soaking overnight in a salt solution. So I've got, so this is the, the brine. I've got lemon and I got cinnamon, I got cloves, I've got, uh, uh, the, I think I said vinegar, but it's, it's vinegar and a little bit of water. All right, so I'm gonna bring this to a boil. It's got some sugar in it and some lemon. And as it comes to a boil, I'm gonna drop 
these in to let them cook a little bit. And they're going to cook in that syrup. All right. In they go. Now, I don't want the temperature of the liquid to drop too much, so I'm adding these rinds one at a time, or one or two at a time. That way the temperature of the liquid will stay good and hot, even though I'm putting cold material in it. Now this is going to take a little while to cook. And it's cooking in that syrup. It's going to absorb all of those really good flavors. All right, so these are cooked. They're starting to clear it up nicely. We're ready to work with these. So let me get, uh, so I don't make a mess. i get this plate. I'm going to take one of these canning jars. So what I'm doing now is just putting these pickles in here. Okay, we've got this all set up. We're going to need a little bit more juice in here. I want this to come up almost to the top. Now I'm going to put these on. But again, I'm not putting these on to can them. I mean, you know, these are ready to be canned, and I could go through a couple of more processes and can them, but I'm just going to chill these down. So I'm going to put this on loose just to keep any thing from falling into them. And now this is going to go into the refrigerator uh, and be ready to eat. I don't have the patience for canning. I make it good and it needs to be eaten right away. So I'll see you next time. Enjoy your pickles. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Watermelons are raised on 338 Virginia farms, and most of the sweet fruit is sold direct to grocery chains, farmers markets, or even right at the end of the driveway in rural Virginia. Southampton County has traditionally been a leader in watermelon production, but they're also raised on the eastern shore and the northern neck, parts of central Virginia, and in southside Virginia. The State Fair of Virginia holds a giant watermelon contest each fall. In 2018, Hank Houston of Spotsylvania County broke the state fair record with a monster melon weighing 254 pounds. Pennsylvania County has been one of Virginia's top farming communities for more than a century. As Burke Muller reports in our county agricultural close-up, Pennsylvania is not just for tobacco anymore. Created in 1767 and named for a prime minister of Great Britain, William Pitt, Pennsylvania County is part of Virginia's vast Southside region. The county is home to some of the state's most fertile soil and has a rich tradition of cattle, dairy, and tobacco farming. And some growers are now taking advantage of an emerging industrial hemp industry. We still are one of the large uh, tobacco producers, uh, five to 6,000 acres of tobacco land here a year. We're one of the largest cattle producers in the, in the state. Uh, we also have a wide variety of produce being produced here in, the, here in the county. And we're very proud of the amount of acreage that we have actually in production. The Old Dominion Agricultural Complex is a facility designed to help all farmers in Pennsylvania County, as well as the greater Southside Virginia agricultural community. It sits on 160 acres of land and is run by the Old Dominion Agricultural Foundation, a nonprofit aimed at improving the farm economy, particularly for smaller farmers. It's been a real mission of the, of the development of the foundation to try to get as many small farmers a value added to their products as possible. Tobacco has played an important role in the county from the very beginning, and it's still a major part of the county's agricultural profile. But tobacco farmers like Robert Mills have had to change with the times. We have poultry, a confined poultry operation. We have cow-calf. We raise four different types of tobacco. We have small grains, and now we're adding industrial hemp. Uh, for a farmer to be successful today, uh, the old cliche, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. Now of having uh, your farm operation being diverse, uh, not only in your crops that you grow, but also in the livestock. Some, like Mills, have started growing industrial hemp as a way to supplement their bottom line. Having the opportunity to grow industrial hemp 
uh, has given us a little of excitement uh, and the fact that it's a new crop uh, that we knew very little about, but it has the promise of being a very profitable crop. So the, our hemp production is something that we're really keeping a close eye on this year as uh, being part of our farm part portfolio. Pittsylvania County has 1,157 farms spread out over 246,322 acres, about one-third of the entire county. The market value of all agricultural products sold was $72.7 million. The top crop raised in Pennsylvania County is clearly tobacco, commanding two-thirds of all crop sales at $20.4 million. Hay, nursery, greenhouse, floriculture, and sod are also important crops. Pennsylvania County's livestock sector is even more valuable, with total income of $42.8 million. Dairy sales come to $22.7 million. $16.8 million worth of cattle and calves are sold each year. Poultry and eggs total $2.5 million. Agriculture and forestry is the largest industry in Pennsylvania County um, and, and plays a pivotal role in uh, not just the agricultural economy but in the general economy. Um, you know, when you look at the, the um, impact that those producers have on uh, the businesses around them, everything from fuel to fertilizer to supply distributors uh, within the area. So um, agriculture is a mainstay of Pennsylvania County's economy as it has been for a very long time and it will continue to be in the future. Dairy farmers like Tommy Motley are key to Pennsylvania County's future as an agricultural powerhouse in Virginia. Where dairy farmers are challenged in many other parts of the state, they are expanding production here. Here in the county, the dairy industry employs, the five dairies employ over 100 people uh, as employees. Plus, and when you start talking about the economic factor, is for every dollar we spend, it exchange or take in, there's seven dollars that returns back to the community. Raising beef cattle is also a big industry in Pennsylvania County. It's an all-out agriculture county, pretty much, and that's that's what I do. That's what I've always done. But cattle producer George Wynn knows what's worked in the past is not guaranteed going forward. And those who survive will need to adapt to new technologies and new business models. There's going to be a lot of, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes uh, as operations in the county that are transferring into uh, going to solar farms. That's going to make a change uh, uh, for a lot of those families. And I see it continuing to go to larger operations. Despite all of this economic success, the current generation of Pennsylvania County farmers is worried that not enough young people view a career in agriculture as their top choice. Bartz believes the next generation may warm up to farming once they understand what it takes to be a farmer and what you get back. There are uh, very few other occupations in the world that can give you the variety that, that farmers experience on any given day. Um, the skill set that's required to, to be a farmer uh, is vast and expanding every day. And so you have the opportunity to have a diverse set of experiences. You have the opportunity to learn and hone a diverse set of skills uh, and, and to um, genuinely take pride in, in what you do and, and what you uh, as an individual in your operation can accomplish. Agriculture is deeply rooted in the economy and culture of Pennsylvania County, and the farmers here are working hard to pass that success on to their children. In Pennsylvania County, Virginia, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. We're so glad you could join us to celebrate all the bounty that Virginia has to offer, from your kitchen to our gardens to our wide open spaces. We're proud to say that this is real Virginia. So for everyone at the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching and make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay